Hello and welcome to Research Basics 101. So the purpose of tonight's webinar is to give you a pretty good review of the different types of resources that are available through the library website, in addition with some advice on how to do the research project. I think when it comes to research, uh, there's always this emphasis on let's have a thesis statement and, and trying to find the, the peer-reviewed scholarly resources that are so necessary for your papers can be really hard to find. So before I start kind of getting you familiar with the different resources that the library had, I actually want to show you this very short, I promise, video of what you have access to through the library website about concept mapping. Now, concept mapping, uh, you may be familiar with this already. You may have had um, a class where your instructor went through this, but what concept mapping does is it takes that very long research thesis statement that you've kind of got in your mind, and it helps to break it down into specific keywords that are really useful in, in trying to find um, the correct books and articles for your research topic. So we'll watch this really quick, but actually I'm gonna copy and paste the tab because underneath the video is uh, some examples of concept mapping as well as the actual concept map yourself. So I am a visual person. I like to, um, and I'm also like to be doing at the same time as I'm learning. So if you find that concept mapping is, is kind of like your jam and you think this is great, this is how I'm gonna do research forever. Um, it helps me not just with research, but with organizing things within my life, like for work or for kids. But um, you can get the links to the concept map example and the draft. It's a PDF copy. If you just click on it, it opens directly, gives you some interesting um, direction on what it is and how to do it, in addition to creating your own concept map, um, which I keep clicking the wrong link here, uh, that you can download, print out, and use. There's also mind mapping software. If, you're, if, that's, your, if that's your thing, you want to do everything electronically, if you are to actually Google concept mapping, uh, there's lots of other resources available, um, but this is like the short and simple and best way to kind of get started on your research project before you start looking through those databases. So we'll check this out. Concept mapping. In this module, you will learn what a concept map is and how to create one for your research. What is a concept map? A concept map is a good way to begin the research process. It can help you to graphically represent and organize ideas and show how they are related to each other. The concept map will help you translate your ideas into a manageable topic and generate questions to focus on in your research. Research is a creative process involving both analysis, in which you take things apart, and synthesis, in which you put things together. Creating a concept map is a visual way of analyzing your topic. And after it is completed, it will help you to both synthesize a research question and give you the search terms to pursue it. Why use a concept map? A concept map can help you organize ideas and define a topic, develop keywords and synonyms, reveal patterns and themes between ideas, and generate search terms for your research. In our example, we will use the topic of vegetarianism to illustrate how to create a concept map. I'll begin by writing it down and then drawing a circle around it to illustrate that this is the main topic. Next, I will begin brainstorming ideas for the topic of vegetarianism. I'll begin with related subtopics, such as varieties of vegetarianism, ethics and diet, health benefits and concerns, the environment and diet, religion and diet, and demographics. The point of this first step is to identify issues that are related to my main topic, which I'll represent with lines in the concept map. A good way to find related topics is by using an encyclopedia, such as the many that the library has available online, or even Wikipedia. I now want to delve deeper and identify examples or related ideas to my subtopics. For instance, ethics and diet is a subtopic of vegetarianism, and animal treatment is an important example of it. Continuing to do this for all of my new subtopics, I now have an extended list of concepts to explore. We may not use all of the information that we write down, 
But this approach lets us easily see the various relationships among our possible topics. Using the concept map to find information. Review the concept map to identify relationships between concepts and to see if all the pieces fit together or if anything is missing. Now completed, consider the concept map's many connections. Each is a dynamic relationship that may change according to your point of view, current events, and many other variables. Exploring these relationships and what dependencies there are between each is a good way to generate a list of research questions for our topic and to identify keywords and synonyms useful for our research. In summary, now you should know how to use a concept map to help you translate your ideas into a manageable topic and generate questions to focus on in your research. Awesome. OK, so that in mind, if you need to take a few minutes to generate your own concept map or if you kind of already have some keywords in mind um, to use with the research, then we will go further into the library database and we will um, practice doing a search using our keywords, um, using App Search, using Books and Media, using Google Scholar, uh, using our databases page, as well as our guides and introduction to interlibrary loan. Um, research, uh, so I'm, I'm totally gonna give you an archeology span analogy because um, before I was a librarian, I was an archeologist. And in archeology, span we have this concept called stratigraphy. And what that means is that the further you dig in the ground, the, the deeper and deeper you go, the older and older um, the artifacts are. So, um, you know, if you just dig kind of a foot in the ground, you might be looking in the past five years. If you go a little further, you're going like 50 years into the past, 100 years into the past. Those paleontologists that are lucky enough to dig up dinosaur bones, they're looking in millions of years in the past. Um, but it's, it's not a, a kind of a, to quote Indiana Jones, it's not an X marks the spot. You know, like we've learned as much as we love Google that we can't necessarily find everything that we need in Google. Because when you type in a topic, um, so Rebecca, I actually use yours as an example. You're talking about student and faculty attitudes about group work and business classes. Uh, typing just that statement in Google is you're probably going to get 5 million hits, but they're going to be anything from somebody's uh, syllabus to somebody's website to somebody's blog to some, maybe some articles not necessarily what you're looking for in terms of your paper but there's going to be certainly a lot of information out there so I tell students primarily if you use the library databases um, there the databases provide lots of, of little tricks and trades that you're going to learn in this in this webinar on how to find peer-reviewed scholarly sources, how just to find articles about your topic without having to go through the 50 million Google site hit that, that generally you get using Google. So for example, if you are on library.appstate.edu, so let me go ahead and copy and paste this and put it in your chat box for you if you want to follow along with your topic. Um, Take, and again, Rebecca, I'm going to put you on the spot here, um, but you're talking about student and faculty attitudes about group work and business classes. So writing, just, just trying to think of a concept map of what that would look like. Um, you might want to talk about group work um, as one of your keywords. I think faculty and students, so he, let's just see what it looks like in the search. That might be easier. So I'm going to click advanced search, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to use your example in, um, student um, attitude, because that's actually a good one. Um, faculty, and then uh, group work, and see if anything comes up. What I highly recommend doing when you're doing research using our site is instead of just, like I did back here before, instead of just kind of going into the app search and typing some things, I would actually click on the ad advanced search link where you get a page that looks like this. This way you can break down your keywords really easily. So we talked about student attitudes, um, group work, and let's um, talk about, uh, we'll, we'll say higher education in this case, and we'll get to faculty in just a second. And then I'm gonna click search. Okay, great. Um, 
like you would expect from like a typical Google search, you get about 2 million hits here just from typing in these three different keywords. Now, if you were to have typed this in and you have got no searches, that's when you're gonna go back to your concept map and you're going to pick some additional keywords because you might not necessarily get some hits on the first try, but with your particular topic, we actually got quite a few. So a couple things to do before you kind of uh, start looking at your results. If you can look under the left-hand side of the screen where it says refine your results, and you've got different means here where you can bring down that two million hit. So maybe you're just looking for peer-reviewed articles. Maybe this is for a project where you are only supposed to lead, they only want you to have scholarly peer-reviewed. Um, you can limit your search to books and media only. Um, for sake of just time, we'll, we'll just look at peer-reviewed articles. You can actually play around with the publication date. Maybe you're not doing a historical analysis. Maybe you're just looking at with attitudes within the last 20 years. So you can kind of play around with publication dates. You can check through source types. Maybe you just want to look at academic journals, which again, um, once you click that peer-reviewed article, that's pretty much what you're going to look for. But if you click on academic journals specifically, um, Yes, and actually you can. You can click on, uh, answer your question, Rebecca, if you can refine to business. You can add a row and you can type in business. Um, you can type in uh, college of business, business department, and that will narrow down your search as well, which it definitely narrowed it down considerably. And again, you can go back to the left-hand side where you can refine your results. Um, you can limit your results to just academic journals. It kind of takes away from the book reviews or the conference materials, reports, or magazines. So you are, in fact, just looking at that scholarly peer-reviewed. So once you kind of check your results, see if there's any articles or things that pop out to you. So um, let's see. Okay, maybe this is the article for you. So if I just click on the title, there's a couple of things that you can, you can gauge. Um, you can find on the left-hand side whether or not this is a PDF full text, which uh, you definitely want to have because it makes it a lot easier to read the article when you have the whole thing. So you can actually click on PDF full text and you can download the article. You can actually email this link to yourself if you're at a public computer. If you like to use Google Drive as a means to save all of your research, you can open up your Google Drive and it will literally pull the article into your Google Drive for you. Um, you can also, if you look on the right-hand side of that article, just by clicking on the icon where it says Cite, you can click on that button and you can find your citation and you can copy and paste your citation into your works cited, into your references, into your um, bibliography. What I highly recommend for students, and I, as a student I, myself, I use Google Drive. Google Drive is like my go-to because um, when I went to grad school way, way back in the dark ages, I saved everything on a desktop or I saved everything on a zip drive or I saved anything. And inevitably, before the paper was due, the computer would die or crash or the zip drive would disappear or my cat would literally took off with it. She was horrible. She was known to steal a lot of our stuff. Um, I use Google Drive now because I can save everything in Google Drive and, know, and it just, it's in the cloud, which means that I, if my computer were to die, knock on wood, um, if, if I just didn't have access to my you know, desktop at the time, I can access my paper, I can access my articles from any device because it's saved in Google Drive. So I actually got used to using that, especially as a um, college student at App because everything's Google, that it made it really easy. So um, for example, uh, if you log into Google, open up your Google Drive, create a folder for your paper, for your class, and you can actually start saving your paper and your articles in that. So that's incredibly helpful for me because I have them all in one place and I can open it from anywhere, um, which is great. So if you ever think that that might be something you'd want to do, contact me. I will walk you through the process. Um, it has saved my life and now I don't have to worry too much about my computer crashing um, because if it does and I get a new one, I still have everything on Google. So that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty awesome. But I love this citation button to get back to the point because um, I will say that you do not want to rely 100% on the citations that you receive from this, um, but it does give you a placeholder. So as I was mentioning earlier, say that you use Google Drive and you're doing your research. What I recommend that you do when you, before you start your research process is to open up a, a folder, a document, 
uh, whether it's Word, whether it's Pages, whether it's Google Doc, create your works cited as you're collecting your article. So for example, if this is the article for you, you'll go to whatever your citation style is, APA, copy and paste, put it on that document, download that article, and you are building your bibliography as you are collecting your resources. And if you decide you're not gonna use that resource, then go back and take it out. But before you submit the paper, to turn it into the Writing Center, come on over here and get the APA Citation Manual Guide, look it up online, which we have, but double check that your citations are correct because I will say that um, they're not always correct when you copy and paste them from the library website. Sometimes they're wrong, but if nothing else, you have a placeholder where you can go back and look at it later. So that's your um, disclaimer. Um, it's not perfect, but it is good if you are just, you know, trying to collect as much, you try to get as much as your research as you can. Um, because if you're like me, you got kids, you got family, you got three other papers you're writing. So this is a quick and easy way to kind of collect your information, build your bibliography, go back, make sure it's fixed before you submit the final paper. Using the library database is almost, well, I will say almost all of them do provide that free citation option. So that's really helpful and useful, um, which you don't necessarily find in Google. So I do recommend um, kind of getting uh, getting used to using that cite button. Like I said, don't rely on it heavily, but like I said, it does act as a placeholder. So a couple things to know just from looking at this site, um, you can read the abstract. Uh, if you look at the major subjects, it will give you additional keywords. So I find in research that if you, um, are researching a specific topic that's been around a while, you know, 10 years ago, um, it might have been referred to something else. It's like, for example, I'm doing work on student veterans. Well, 10 years ago, they were referred to as military students. And, you know, 20 years before, they weren't really writing about them. So knowing the different names also helps. And that, that can also be one of the things that kind of comes up in your concept map, the different uh, names or titles that uh, certain subjects have been referred to. So um, looking at the major subjects sometimes can give you additional keywords to add if you're not finding a lot um, in your first initial search. But this is why I really like to use App Search because it does give me a lot of options. Um, it does let me refine my results to just looking at scholarly peer reviewed. It makes it a lot easier to discern what I'm looking at. Um, two, what's really nice is that uh, if you look on the uh, left hand side of each of the hits and look at the little icon, it tells you if what you're looking at is an academic journal, if it's an ebook, if it's a print book, if it's a streaming video. Um, so if I were to unclick the, just the peer-reviewed articles and go back to that $2 million hit that we got earlier, you can see the different types of um, resources uh, that come up from typing in these keywords. So that's one way to kind of do your search in app search. And then if you're not having much luck with your keywords, that's when you'll go back to that concept map and maybe plug in some different keywords and just keep plugging around until you find, um, until you're able to find the resources that you're really really interested in and, and that definitely apply to your your paper so the second tab within the page of looking is the actual books and media tab now how this is different from app search is that you are simply looking at books ebooks streaming video documentaries this is the different type of media and if you were to get into the habit of clicking the ASU, WCU plus UNCA button when you're doing your search. Um, and then you can also type in uh, keyword subject title, but we'll go into advanced search. And what you're looking at in this is that these are, these are books. So um, for example, uh, Sharon, I'll actually use an example that you told me about. You're interested in the art of henna. So I might type in henna just to see um, what books we have on the subject. And actually, it might be easier just to search in this way. So click on books and media, subject. I'm going to search all three because um, as ASU students, you actually have access to the ASU library, the Western Carolina University Library, and the UNC Lay Library. And you're actually searching all three databases. And what happens is if you find a book that, is, that you absolutely want and it's at um, Western or UNCA, you can request that book and I'll show you how that works and the book gets delivered to you. So if you're a DE student, it gets sent to your house. If you are an on-campus student, faculty, staff, um, it will be sent here to the Belk Library where you can pick it up. 
So I'm going to look for henna. Um, maybe I will, I'll, maybe not as a subject, maybe I'm going to look at a keyword because I'm not applying anything. And let me know if I'm spelling it incorrectly. Okay, no, here we go. Okay, so patterns in henna. This is kind of cool. So a couple things to note before you start going down the list is to look at what you're on the left-hand side. Again, look at that icon. This is a book, so I am looking at a print book. If there is an E, that means I am looking at an e-book. So we will get to e-books in just one second. Um, so say that the patterns in henna, this book is kind of interesting. A couple things I'm gonna note just from looking at it is where the location. So I know that this book is in the ASU main stacks. The call number is where in the stacks that's listed. So you can do a couple things if this book is interested, interesting to you and you know you're gonna be on campus and you're gonna to wanna to check it out. You can either write this call number down or you can send it to yourself as a text message. Um, if you type in the text message, it doesn't cost anything. You'll literally get a text with the call number so you know when you come to the library to go to the second floor and that's where the book will be located. And then you wanna check the status. It's gonna let you know if the book's been checked out or not. In this case, it hasn't, so that's cool. If you are a distance education, you're a doctoral student or you're faculty, um, or maybe it's just two feet of snow outside and you cannot get out of your driveway, but you know you're gonna want this book, you can click on right here where it says request on the request tab at the top. You're gonna click on that and you're gonna enter in your identification. So you'll log in, App State, you're gonna use your username and password and click submit. If you're like me and you're just simply lazy and you don't want to come and go through all the stacks, you can actually request as many books, up to 99 books this way. Um, and the way that the process works is that uh, students that work in the library, they'll go upstairs, they'll grab the books, they'll process them, they'll have them at the front desk or um, choose, dependent upon the population you are. So for example, if you are a distance learning or a doctoral student, you can click on that and the books will be shipped to your house. Um, if you're going to pick them up on campus, excuse me, I have the hiccups, you can click on ASU Library Services Desk and click Submit, and you'll receive an email when the book is available to you. Now, I will say that it does take about 24 to 48 hours to process this, so if, if um, like I said, you're snowed in and you know you won't be in until Monday, uh, you can go ahead and collect the books. You'll receive an email when they're ready. Or you know, you're already here, you just wanna go get them. Um, you can head on up to the second floor and collect the books. So that's how that works in terms of getting print books from the library. So I'm gonna go back to our search just to look some more. So um, like I said, kind of noticing if you see the book is actually in Asheville, you can, you can go back and request that book through that same requested process. Um, the book will get picked up from Asheville. It'll be driven down here. Um, if you're a distance education student or a doctoral student, it will be processed in our ABC office, and then it will be shipped to your mailing address that you have with the registrar. This is a free uh, service that we provide. You will get a prepaid envelope uh, to take to the United, to the Postal Service, so when you're done with your items, you'll uh, have all that to give them. It won't cost you anything, and then you can proceed to check out more books. So it's a, it's a, it's a cool service. Um, don't be afraid to use eBooks. As you will see, the majority of our, our it seems like we're, we're just purchasing more and more eBooks as time goes by because they are cheaper and they're great and they're a great resource. And I tell folks to not be, um, a lot of people don't like to use eBooks because um, the thing about ebooks is that there's there's many different ways that you can access them here. Um, we have you can download the apps, you can get the username and passwords, you can um, if you're interested in um, popular books or audio books, we've got several um, different ways that you can access them. And so what I tell students is that if you are interested in downloading eBooks or the audio books to come to the library, to give us a call, to, to arrange a wrap session where we can meet with you, because it is a bit of a process. But if you're simply just looking at books um, that you can just, you want, you just wanna kinda look at it now, and don't download them, simply just connect to them. So in this case, um, I'm gonna connect to this resource online by clicking on this link. 
And this is going to, it's just like what we've looked at before. It gives you a description. Um, it gives you a table of contents. As you can see, some eBooks will actually allow you to download full chapters. So if you don't want, you just want a chapter out of the book because that there's only one or two chapters that's actually pertaining to your subject, you can go ahead and download those. Um, but instead of downloading the entire eBook, always just go with the read online option, no matter what it looks like. Sometimes it's gonna look like this, sometimes it's just gonna open up automatically. But what that does is that opens the book up automatically on your device. You have not downloaded it, you are simply just looking at it in real time. And this is like the equivalent of taking the book off the shelf and you're holding it in your hand, and you're flipping the pages, you haven't quite decided if you want to check the book out, you have not checked it out, you were just looking. Um, gives you a chance to peruse through the chapters. You can actually click on the chapters before downloading to make sure you have the right chapters. You can look at the um, index. So if you're looking for specific topics, you can literally go into the indices. Like I said, it's like holding that book in your hand and flipping through it. If it's a book that you definitely will use um, and you feel like you really just want to download it and have it, like I said, make an appointment with us. We will walk you through the process because every ebook is owned by different vendors and they have their own username and passwords or their own apps. And so it can be a little complicated to navigate that. But if you're simply just wanting a couple of chapters, that's an easy thing you can do. You can simply just download those chapters. And also, again, look at that top. Look for that citation icon where you can copy and paste the citation of the ebook. Now again, it may not be perfect because you know you're going to want to check that at the end, but it, nothing else, it's a placeholder. So you are building your bibliography as you're collecting your ebooks. I find that I use ebooks all the time. I'm really comfortable with them, but it took me a while because I'm an old school librarian. You know, I like the books. I like the book smell. Um, but in, uh, there are many subjects specifically within health sciences and computer science by where by the time the book is published, it's already obsolete. And um, these kind of books as well can be very, very expensive. So it's always kind of cheaper for students to access the eBooks or to you know, check out the books from the library just to see if we have them um, you know, before buying textbooks. We don't purchase textbooks specifically, but sometimes you get some instructors that um, will require just regular reading books and you can check to see if we have them and check them out. So eBooks are a really great way to, um, to kind of get around paying for, for books and, they, and they're easily accessible, which is nice because if you're you know, wanting to get a print book and everybody in your class has checked it out, you have to wait for so-and-so to return it. A lot of times with eBooks, you can just open them directly and there is no waiting. And I do like, I do use personally the, the downloading chapters because um, then you're saving money that you're not printing stuff. So that's really, that's really cool too. So going back to the library site, um, now that I've showed you kind of how the books work, is uh, I want to show you our, our Google Scholar. Now, Google Scholar on the library.appstate.edu is the exact same googlescholar.com that you usually go to. But I highly recommend using Google Scholar through our library website because if we have it, the article or the book, it shows up here right on the right hand side. So as you can see, it looks like Google Scholar, it feels like Google Scholar, it is Google Scholar. We just linked our Google Scholar to the existing databases within the library. And I actually find that Google Scholar, I get more hits using our Google Scholar for my topics than I do using App Search. And I think it's because, uh, and it, somebody tried to explain it to me, it's something to do with an algorithm, but essentially I get better, um, information using Google Scholar. The only problem is I don't get that um, necessarily that citation aspect that I like from the library databases, but it's still useful. So for example, um, so this is an interesting um, article on henna that I might be interested in. So if I click where on the right hand side where it appears, the PDF shows up. I can download it, I can save it, I can put it in, if I'm using um, a citation software like Zotero, I can save it in Zotero, I can save it in my Google folder, um, I can save it on my desktop, however I want to. And it's, um, it's, it's nice. So like I said, I have, um, I have a lot of, of luck using Google Scholar because I'm used to it, I'm familiar with it, I like the feel of Google, um, but it doesn't necessarily give me the citation off options that using the library databases do. Something to note when you are using Google Scholar on our library website is that you are still using the library website. I know we have a lot of instructors that say don't use Google, don't use the internet. Um, 
you are linking to the library pages. You are linking to the databases that we subscribe to. You're not cheating when you use our Google Scholar. We know that you're using Google, so we made it easy for you. You are still accessing the library website in addition to um, Google Scholar. So it's like a twofer, and it's, it's pretty cool. And uh, like I said, I, the doctoral program, use that a lot but actually I use a lot more through going to the databases directly, which is what I'll show you how to do next. So we've kind of went through app search, books and media, Google Scholar, that's just from using the main page. But if you go to find resources, which if you click right here under the Belk Library and Information Commons tag where it says find resources, click on that. You can also check the books and media, films and streaming video, course reviews, and databases. So if you click on the databases box with me, what we've done is we've taken all of the databases that we subscribe to, and there are many, 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 many databases. Um, we have quite the budget. We're a pretty happening small library with a lot of great stuff. We're like a research institution. Um, it's, it's pretty awesome. I, this has like been the best library I've ever worked at in terms of the databases. And you can go through these databases pretty easy. If you have a specific one that you go by name, so uh, maybe you're into JSTOR, uh, maybe you want to look at WorldCat because you want to see what is available at all the libraries, Maybe you're going through type. Maybe you have instructor that's wanting you just to look at primary sources or you're needing information about statistics and data. You can also search by subject. So in this case, um, for a business class, maybe we'll click on the business link. And what the business link provides is you get information from um, who the subject librarian is. So say, Rebecca, you are having a hard time trying to find resources and you really need some help, you can actually contact Leslie Ferrison, who is your librarian. She is the librarian for the Walker College of Business and she's fantastic and very knowledgeable and will be very happy to help you um, with further questions you might have. Or you can also just go through the different types of databases that these, now that going through the databases as opposed to going through App Search and Google Scholar is that I will tell you that um, both App Search and Google Scholar do search a, a good chunk of the available library databases, but they don't search all. And that's the way that discovery, um, they call them discovery searches, but they don't necessarily search everything that the library has. So when you are doing more in-depth, you know, graduate level research, you're actually gonna go into these databases and you're going to do searches in them individually. So for example, I love Business Source Complete. I find this very helpful. Um, because within Business Source Complete, you can browse through subjects, company profiles, industry profiles, business videos, company information, working papers, economic reports for countries. Um, these databases are very specific to the topic of business. So you're only going to get hit, um, research about business through newspapers or academic journals, however you do your search. And you do the same advanced search that you did using app app search you would kind of um, type in your keywords you do a search you can limit your your searches and still get that same view so for example um, I'm gonna do business college uh, group projects perceptions Okay, oh, oh, wow. Okay, so Rebecca, I'm totally gonna copy and paste this link and give it to you in the chat box because it looks like there could be some cool stuff in here for your topic. Let me know if you can't access that. Um, so it's gonna look just like the app search. You're gonna click on the title. Um, you're gonna review the abstract. You're gonna look at the subject terms just in case. You can see that site button's gonna be right here on the right-hand side. Here's access to the PDF full text, so you can click on that and get the whole article. Actually, this one might be really good. And say, okay, so Rebecca, again, I'm totally gonna use this as my example, but say that this is the definitive article this is perfect. This is exactly what you're looking for. I highly recommend getting into the practice of scrolling down to the references of these articles or these books and seeing who they cite because chances are they have already done a lot of the research for you because if you have to have five or six articles about this topic, you can go into the references of the already established articles and you can see who they cited. So they may have cited those seminal um, 
authors that you may not be aware of yet. And then you can copy and paste those titles back in that app search into Google Scholar and you can get articles that way. I use this all the time um, for my doctoral research because I am doing a topic that is not very well published. So I'm literally looking at the same articles over and over again. So yeah, this saves you so much time. In fact, I tell these to my 11th hour students, the ones that waited to the last minute to write the paper, and they have to show up with 10 articles for a bibliography by tomorrow. I said, good, find the one article, pick out those, read them, you know, just lose sleep tonight, just do it. Um, so getting into the habit of that too has also been very helpful. It definitely saves you lots of time. And so you're going to go through the different types of the, the business database list and you're going to do exactly what you've done each time. Now you're not going to look at all of these databases, um, but kind of read them, get some information, see if they're useful. Email Leslie, just say, hey, Leslie, I am working on this project. Could you give me some advice? And that's what we do. Um, don't hesitate. Email your librarian the way you email your professor for guidance because I'll tell you something. Um, we're faculty librarians. We have been working with the, the instructors for years. You are not the only student in this class that we have helped to talk to. Um, so do not hesitate to contact us at any time um, within your research process because we can give you a lot of shortcuts and a lot of direct hits. I've been known to help out my DE students on a lot of stuff um, just to save them the time and they were just, you know, thank you for, you know, asking me for help because that's why I'm here. So don't hesitate to do that either. So the databases page is really amazing. I use this a lot, um, especially with my work. I, and especially if I have uh, topics that kind of, I call it cross-pollinate. So I'm getting an education degree, but I'm also kind of doing anthropological studies. And so each, you'll find that a lot of the databases will overlap. You'll see a lot of the same databases on, on different pages, but it's another means that you can go in and just get specific information to your topic. So a couple things you've got, um, you know you've got help by talking to your subject librarian. You know that you've got some um, avenues to go. But say that you've gone through our databases and you've gone through the app search and you've looked at all our books and Google Scholar and you are finding resources that we simply do not have. And that is where Interlibrary Loan comes into place. Interlibrary Loan is a service that we offer to all students, staff, and faculty. It is, Interlibrary Loan is access to thousands of libraries in 180 different countries, meaning if we don't have the book, we can get it for you. Um, Interlibrary Loan is very useful for dissertations as well. Uh, if you are a first time user, you are going to want to click here and get an account because your username and password, your banner username and password will not work. It's not connected to banner. So if you're a first time user, you're going to go in and you're going to fill out this information and you only have to fill it out once. Just try to remember your password, but if you don't, it's all good. We can help you change it. But you can go into interlibrary loan and you can request books and articles and media that we do not have access to. So say you were on Google Scholar and you found the perfect article and we don't have it, you can actually go in and request it. And the easiest way to do that, or if there's a, a book on Amazon um, that, uh, you know, faculty are saying, hey, we're going to read this extra book, you can buy it on Amazon, wait before you buy the book. Now, like I said, we don't purchase textbooks, we don't do that. But you can go on Interlibrary Loan and see if other libraries have the book. So if you are having to read, like, uh, uh, The Life of Henrietta Lacks, which is not a textbook, but it's a pretty popular book and you don't want to purchase it, but I highly recommend that you should. The Immortal Life of Henry and Lacks is actually a great book. Um, you can go into Interlibrary Loan and request it. This, this also works for articles. So say that you find the perfect article or the dissertation or thesis, fill in as much information as you can and click Submit Request. And what happens is, what I love about Interlibrary Loan is that once you put in the request, you can actually check on the status. It's not like when you use the internet and sometimes you request something and it just kind of goes out into internet space and you never hear back until it does, the stuff just kind of magically appears. Within your library alone, you can actually follow the process of the book. So for example, I'm on this true crime kick, so don't judge. Um, so here's where I've submitted the request because surprisingly we don't have this book here. Um, and I can watch 
kind of the process of where the book is sent. And then when the book gets here, I'll get an email saying, hey, the book is waiting for you at the library services desk, or it's being mailed to you because you're a doctoral slash DE student, or here's a link to the PDF of the article that you requested. Interlibrary loan is great. Don't ever, ever pay for your research because you have already paid for this in your student fees. So, or if you're faculty, guess what? This is your perk. Staff, this is your perk. We, we unfortunately pay for parking, but you don't have to pay for research. So use interlibrary loan um, for all of your research needs and maybe even some fun reading needs like, um, like I said, don't judge. I am on this crazy, um, true crime kick, but you can get popular books as well using interlibrary loan.